The time has come to document Gold Burst. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. That's right, I bought this guitar back, and now it's time to finally review and document it in a way that will preserve this thing for the internet forever. It's time to learn all about the color that I've been calling the name wrong this entire time. First off, let's correct the name. The official color code on this one is known as Harvest Gold. Now, how did it become known as Gold Burst? Well, you know, it's kind of a gold color. It's a burst. And then people would also call it Harvest Burst. I've heard some people call it Bronze Burst. All those names make sense, but the official code is quite simply Harvest Gold. I asked Randy Leonard, and he did have a Harvest Gold guitar written down in his ledgers, even though he doesn't normally write down the colors. That happened to be an anomaly on one of them, and I was able to find old paperwork on a warranty card where it was listed as Harvest Gold. So those are two very reputable sources. So that's what we need to call this thing from now on, Harvest Gold. And it was used from late 1980 until 1983 when it was discontinued. This finished has a storied past. The reason why you don't see many of these out there is most of them were sent back to the factory to be refinished. And there are two different versions of Harvest Gold. So this is the initial run. You don't find it on Les Paul Customs until about 1981. We'll talk about the model that predates this. But it has a nice dark, kind of bronzy, rustic look to it. And then you've got that really nice gold finish on the top. It continues on to the side just like any other bursted color. The issue with this finish is the dark border used a real bronze in the base coat, just like the original gold tops, you know, the thing that turns the old gold tops green, and it causes an orange peel effect. So this orange peel is like the texture of the outside of an orange. After about a year or so of the finish curing, that would not go away. So these gold bursts are well known for having a pitted finish. People would play them, and areas that got all bunched up like right here would catch against the player, and it would start to chip and flake off. That same textured finish will be found alongside the neck, so it's very common for the whole finish to flake off the neck on these things, if not heavily green. That started to happen to these within a year of being sent out from the factory. People had a five-year warranty on these things, so Gibson would refinish them. And it's rumored that only about 50 of the original Harvest Golds were created. But I was telling you earlier, there were two versions of Harvest Gold. This was the first, this is the second. Seeing them side by side, you can tell the initial one, it was a little bit darker. It's that red-brown border, whereas the newest one has more of a gold edge, like it's an official gold burst. However, that version was also called Harvest Gold. That's the one that was in Randy's ledgers, and the case tag belonged to one of the first runs, so they did not change the name. So I'm hypothesizing it's very similar to the candy apple red color that came out at this time. It suffered a very similar fate of the orange peeled finish. Most of them got refinished until they retooled the color into a silver base coat. That's my theory. I think the new gold one actually uses the silver base coat rather than the real bronze metallic flake. And that's what makes up for the majority of the difference in color. However, I think they also might have played with it a little bit as well. For example, here's a side-by-side -side shot of silver candy apple red and gold base coat, and you can tell they almost look completely different. One's ketchup and the other's really dark. But the nice thing about Gen 2 Harvest Golds is the fact that they don't orange peel. I used to think the Gen 2 color scheme would have been the bad ones of these refinished, but then if you think about it, you would see the serial numbers predate these, and I haven't at this point in time. So they probably just sent them a new guitar would be my guess. So Silver Burst and Harvest Gold, they go hand in hand. But I was kind of curious, how did they come up with these hues? And I have two good theories. The first one, in 1977, Guitar Center did a 25th anniversary run, and they had a silver Les Paul custom done. It's around that exact same time when Gibson toys around with the first Silver Burst prototypes. So I really do believe it's because of Guitar Center ordering that batch that they started to maybe play around with Silver on a custom and they came up with Silver Burst. And then, to follow that up, in 1980, they did an all gold Les Paul custom. But if you've been paying attention, you know 1980 is the first time that they started to toy around with Gold Burst. Is it because of those gold customs that they thought, okay, let's shoot this on a custom? Before then, you'd just find it on, like, deluxe and standards. So putting gold on a Les Paul wasn't necessarily a novel idea like the silver at that time. But I truly believe those might have been influential. However, armed with the search term Harvest Gold, in the late 70s and early 80s, Harvest Gold was all the rage in the kitchen appliances. 
<laughs> Look at this entire kitchen in it. You can also see this stove that literally has the exact paint job of Gen 2 Harvest Gold. <laughs> It's hilarious. If you think about it, the original TV Les Paul Juniors, it was because TVs had that limed mahogany finish. And I suppose while we're talking about it, the fire brand, the fly specking, that's what the black splatter paint's called. That was birthed in 1980 as well, came out of the furniture realm. So Gibson pulling things out of furniture is not necessarily anything new. And in many ways, that's probably where Fender got Antigua from, because that's what a lot of those kitchen sets also look like. So besides the Les Paul Custom, what other models featured the Harvest Gold finish? I'm pretty sure the first one to feature it was the Gibson E2 because you can find those dated to 1980. You can also find some V2s in a similar finish. Then they started to play around with the Les Paul Customs. Then we eventually get the XR1 series. Steve Clark made a Harvest Gold one of those very popular. And then you can even find it on the Paul Firebrand Deluxe models late in their production. And then there was a batch of custom shop edition Les Paul standards in Harvest Gold version number two. I've seen about three or four of those floating around online. And as a standard, they got the gold hardware on top of the cool finish. So this color is really rare. However, it's just not really as desirable as Silver Burst because there's not a huge famous user behind these. Bill Kelleher of Mastodon kind of reps this because his signature guitars birthed in the 2010s era were the Golden Axe Explorer and Halcyon Les Paul, which had a similar color. But I was actually able to dig up a photo of Ace Fraley rocking one of these at one point in time, so that's kind of cool, but that was probably just a one-off concert. So generally speaking, a really clean gold burst is insanely hard to find. Everything is stacked up against it. It's not necessarily meant to be a player if you find one clean. This one right here is the most perfect gold burst in the original configuration to still exist. I had first gotten this guitar, I think it was about five or six years ago, and I sold it on. I knew it was rare, but I just didn't fully understand. I would literally never see another one this perfect again. And I just recently took that road trip to buy that cool Explorer, and I stopped by Mr. Gold's collection, where it has sat ever since I shipped it off, and he decided to sell this back to me as well as that Candy Apple Custom. There's not another one cleaner than this. There's a small ding on the back, and that's about it. It still has all the orange peel, it just hasn't been played enough to make it start to fall off. So this is a true surviving example. Even our gold is in really good shape. It's a little bit hazed over, but I should be able to clean that up. A lot of these got the flip out winding tuners. Unfortunately, this one did not. So that's the other cool thing about Gold Burst is it came out in the era when cool things were starting to come in and major changes. So if you buy an 81 Harvest Gold, it's gonna have the maple neck and still have a volute. If you buy an 82, it's gonna have the mahogany neck without the volute. And then if you get one all the way in 83, it'll probably have the nine hole weight relief. So this is just one of those kind of early 80s mystery guitars that doesn't really get talked about too much but it has been reissued off and on or a gold burst name has been used like on the summer jam les pauls that was more of like a gold border with a natural center which was kind of interesting recently melody music shop came out with a viceroy gold burst which looks very similar to a gen 1 run of harvest gold then the Mod Shop pays tribute to this quite often, like here's a 50s tribute that they did in Gold Burst. And then you could even say like the old Tinsel Burst that they did for Christmas two years ago kind of pays homage to this rare finish. So there we go. That's a quick crash course on this rare finish that not everybody knows the full story of. But to learn even more about this one, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs. I've got some bad news. This isn't the perfect example I thought it was. Our neck pickup has actually been replaced on this example. Thankfully, it's a 1978 T-top. It's worth about the same as a neck pickup Tim Shaw. And the bridge still is the original one from 1981. But I started to have doubts after I cleaned this because this pickup was kind of matted over and I polished it up and it still didn't quite look the same as this one, nice and pristine. So I was thinking, ah, I bet that's been replaced. Or it could be somebody's hand tarnished this one a little bit more because it does have some gold wear to the edges now that it's been cleaned up. 
So Matt said, hey Trogly, didn't you sell this guitar before as original? Yeah, that's my bad. This is the same era when the snake pit scam happened to me. I didn't know everything yet. I probably didn't even know to look for the rounded corners of the pickups to know that they were vintage, but everything, you know, looked in place. It was so clean, nobody expected it. So now I'm kind of conflicted. Do I find an era correct Tim Shaw and put that in there and change the look of the guitar that has been in my head forever? Or do I leave it as is? Because I do happen to have this set of 1982 Tim Shaw's and the neck pickup would indeed kind of match the similar vibes as the bridge if I cleaned it up a little bit more. However, it would still be an 82 paired with an 81. I would always know it's not the correct, correct one. So I think I've made the decision to leave it as is. So I guess that's the moral of the story. Just because it looks 100% correct, still take the time to take it apart. The readings within the circuit, 7.3k ohms in the bridge, 7.42 in the neck, and a combo of 3.68 in the middle. Here is a look inside the neck pickup cavity of one of these. Short neck tenon, as is the correct spec for this era. And then as we try to figure out when the second pancake layer disappears, 1981, it is still there. So you can see that small layer of maple right before the maple top joins to the mahogany body. And here's what the rest of that cavity looks like. All looking peachy. Now let's talk about our bridge and tailpiece. Typical ones of the era. Nashville in style. Schaller made in Germany. And then a full weight gold tailpiece. In good condition yet, with a casting mark in the center. This example was far from dirty and grimy, but I decided to give it the full deluxe polish job anyway. A lot of what I was feeling on here was gunk on it because it had definitely been displayed, but it still has the whole orange peel effect. You can still feel it, but again, it's only in the outer bronze coat. And while you can definitely see it on the bottom edge, it's mainly only prevalent where they got really heavy with the finish up here. Especially after cleaning it, you hardly even feel it around the bottom side. So that proves again that the border finish is the only thing that has issues because the center is perfectly fine. That's a nice shiny gold. Now was I scared when I was polishing this thing? There's only one area really sticking up and it's right here. I'm very scared of this area on this guitar so I was made sure to carefully polish around it because that's all it takes is one little finish chip and then if anything gets in there that discolors it's just going to spread across the entire guitar. Otherwise I noticed a small ding right here in the binding. There's a really minuscule ding right here and the pickguard has left an impression. And here's what it looks like without a pickguard on, but a lot of people were curious, since there's so many different hues even within this version, does this finish fade over time? Yes, look at that, that is the pickguard shadow. So this actually started way darker, even the center gold color had like a little bit of an amber tint to it. I was very shocked to see that, to say the least. Right here, you can see the ending of the pit guard. It's not a huge change, but it definitely had a little bit of a darker tint to it rather than the paler gold. Speaking of our pit guard, here it is. It's got scratches. Moving on from our mahogany body and maple top, we've got our three-piece maple neck, and now look at these frets. You can actually go back to that old video. It had the same strings that I just picked it up on, so they were at least 10 years old. Those things were just as frosted looking as the pickup covers were. And the same thing was true with our frets, so I took the time to polish those back up into perfection. I don't really notice any fret wear on this. It was probably played a little bit early on. Then who knows the rest of the tale? We've got a 24 3 quarter inch scale length with a 12 inch fretboard radius and neck specs of 1.71 inches at the nut which increases to 2.05 by the 12th. First fret neck depth 0.86 and 0.98 by the 10th. There's that neck at the first fret and the 12th fret. It's just a nice rounded C. It's more of a 60s profiled neck with our small side marker inlays. This is a Nashville built guitar. As far as the headstock goes, nothing too much to report up here. Just a nice, clean, lightly yellowed lacquer. Hardly even aged at all. And in our truss rod cavity, we can see our maple neck, as well as the person who filed the frets at the factory, and our truss rod's in perfect shape. And here's a look at that truss rod cover. Looking at the back, I did the exact same polishing process. And again, it's the 
big heavy bronzed areas that you can see all the orange peel effect on but I really like it on the back because it's kind of funny the finish also kind of sinks into the wood grain it's slightly transparent in that aspect so it gives you a rather interesting effect orange peel with lacquer sink <laughs> is it a defect yeah but it's also part of history that's why I question early Murphy lab guitars where the finish flakes off of it will they be seen as collectible one day because most of them get sent back and refinished right so in 40 years will people pay a premium for a guitar that has the finish just flaked off everywhere i think it comes down to how many they make that's what makes these special there were so few to begin with so the few surviving examples that are out there you know it's just kind of cool that they're still there we do have some sort of an impression slash ding right there otherwise it's not really too badly chewed up or anything this was produced in the era that had the metal tin but when i say this one is tight it is tight some of these are really hard to get out this one took some work using a screwdriver and using the screws as like chopsticks not all of them are that bad here's our wiring yeah obviously our neck has been swapped out it's really not even soldered in there that good and then the bridge pickup that that's a really healthy solder amount but usually gibson didn't go that heavy so that tells me there was probably a completely different set of pickups in this at one point in time and you know now that i think about it i wonder if this is what saved this example because technically replacing your pickups voids your warranty. I'm hypothesizing that they did this very early on in the guitar's life. And then when the finish started to have issues, Gibson was like, yeah, too bad. You modified your guitar. We're not going to refinish it. Then the guy was dejected, didn't want the finish to start flaking off, sold it off, and somebody realized that this could become a collectible one day. It's a fun way to romanticize replaced pickups anyway. But that bridge one is definitely original, and maybe they thought this other neck one was original, and they mistakenly put it back in, or who knows. All I can tell you is the neck is definitely not the one that's supposed to be in here. All of our pots are dating to 1981, around the first week of September, 35th week. So at least those have never been messed with. And this is pre-CNC machines routing out the body. They just use their drill run. And then I thought this thing was interesting. I'm not sure what it is. It almost looks like a glob of paint. At first I thought it was one of the stickers that you normally see. And I suppose it could be one of those. And then it was just painted over and then it's really like built up. But it kind of reminds me of like a horseshoe crab. But over here on the edge, you can see a small flake of the finish. That's what I'm trying to avoid on the top. There's our cool posi lock strap locks. That was a relatively new part at this time. We've got the thick binding in the cutaway, and the edges also have that bronze and gold bursting pattern to it. There's a little bit of clear coat wear along the edge, but that could have happened when the factory is buffing it. And then a quick look along the other side. It's just such a fantastic example of one of these. There is some stand rash, though. It's hardly noticeable. And now the back side of the neck. It's primarily the gold, so that's kind of what makes this one better than the candy apple red that we'll re-review here again in a couple of days, because the neck doesn't feel weird for the most part. Like, you get a little bit on the edges, but the way I play, I don't really run up along the edges much. And there used to be a lot of scuffs here by the headstock. Thankfully, those polished off. That's looking quite clean now, but it has become a dust magnet. But if you get it in the light just right, you can see the three-piece maple neck seams. The serial number dates it to 1982, 131st day of the year. Production number 574, Nashville produced. There is a small finish chip on the base side horn. All said and done, it's quite chunky though. 11 pounds, 6.7 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how the gold burst sounds. <laughs>
about harvest gold where are my final thoughts on this i'm super glad i bought it back cleaned it up i never realized just how much this gold will actually play depending on the lighting situation there actually was a custom shop version that had like a black center that they had called something like gold burst as well so now i kind of understand where that comes from after seeing it from this angle as far as the tones go it sounds pretty good with the t-top in the neck and the shaw and the bridge it definitely inspired me to want to play lower but unfortunately the pole pieces were so jacked up on it, I couldn't really do heavy pole muting techniques, but at the same time, it gave a really nice mellow finger picking tone that I liked. I'm a bit too scared to go really heavy on this one though, because it survived this long, we might as well preserve this example. So is it worth paying a premium for one of these if you're just a player? Only if you really like the color and you have to have it on a vintage guitar. Otherwise, this is more so for collectors in my opinion, but it's such a cool color. I just think you're probably going to have a better time with like a modern day reissue of it if you don't want to have to worry about finish issues. But some players, they don't mind sanding down the back of the neck. So if you can find one where it's just flaking away, you might as well just finish the job and make it a really comfortable guitar. But I will definitely be holding this one back in my collection for future generations to enjoy. The original Harvest Gold Les Paul Custom. I hope you enjoy your new guitar knowledge. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.